my great pleasure to uh, slowly start this uh, conference, uh, which uh, will take two days. Uh, all meetings will take place in this building, uh, in the Institute of Political Science. Uh, we will have a quite busy program uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we'll have also very distinguished guests uh, uh, during uh, the opening session, but also during the thematic groups uh, which will follow. Uh, so uh, I won't take too much of your time, but uh, I just want to say that uh, this is the first conference uh, of the Polish Sociological Association, uh, Sociology of Work section after some years. Uh, and uh, it's kind of relaunching of the, of the sociology of work section. Uh, and we worked uh, quite hard with the uh, academic board and the organizing committee to put together this, uh, this conference. So I'm really grateful for everyone who cooperated uh, to make this event happen. Uh, we are very pleased that we managed to combine this uh, conference with uh, uh, visit of Professor Guy Standing, who had the keynote speech at the beginning of, uh, of, of the conference. Uh, this visit is uh, possible thanks to the support of the city of Wrocław, uh, the visiting uh, professor program. Uh, we are very happy that we have the two special sessions, uh, one on workplace innovation, uh, which will take place tomorrow, and another one is our project open day of the changing employment project, uh, also tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, well, this conference uh, has a theme of the social boundaries of work uh, and it's a quite controversial theme uh, also for some members of the uh, academic uh, uh, board of the conference, but we discuss it quite heavily uh, and uh, the idea behind the theme is that simply we have to start discussion on what is work, what is not work, taking into account the changes uh, which are taking place in the sphere of employment nowadays. Uh, and, uh, well, we got over 100 answers to our call for papers. Uh, we accepted uh, uh, a lot of papers. Uh, we have 100 registered participants from 16 countries. Uh, so uh, this is, this is uh, really something uh, which goes beyond local dimension. Dear guests, honorable professors, in behalf of the Dean of the Faculty of the Social Sciences, with a great pleasure and with appreciativeness, I would like to visit you here in that buildings of the our faculty. Here you are, as uh, Marcin Brzozowicki said, uh, we are in the Institute of Political Science, building, but also there are a lot of another kinds of uh, other uh, studies here, in not only political science, but mostly in sociology, which is well known, as I could say, in the whole Poland with the sociological concept. But of course, I would like to say, however, that we are in Wrocław place, Hopefully and surely you can visit some places here, especially because of the weather and today's conference. Hopefully, don't work too hard intellectually, but maybe you find out so many places and time just to get relaxed for a moment, for a moment and for a while. Anyway, I would like to say that such a conference, which is on the social boundaries of work, I mean, the second subtitle is Changes in the Sphere of Work in the 21st Century Capitalism seems to be very extremely interesting, especially because of the ghosts, guests, I mean your uh, presentations, and because of the subjective and objective um, problems were given during this subject and topic. I am really delighted that you have the possibility and the opportunity to present your ideas and hopefully it will be a good impact to scientific discussion in all world because you are international team here. And surely, uh, 
I'm even definitely concerned that you have a lot in common in your scientific way. This is, of course, a very complex topic which embraces not only sociological perspective but combining with economic and political as twice. So, surely the discussion should be very fruitful and I wish you such many discussions, but not only in formal matters, but in formal as well. Thank you very much and I would like to say that today we have plenty of many of ceremonies because of the university celebrities today. So I have to go for the another events, I mean in scientific way, but surely you are the guests and you should feel that whenever you be in Wrocław you can visit Faculty of Social Sciences. I am very glad and I would like to thank uh, um, Dr. Adam Mrozowicki because he is the spiritual movement of the conference. So, once again, have a good time here in Wrocław during the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dean. Uh, now I would like to pass the microphone to uh, our Director for International Relations uh, at the Institute of Sociology, uh, Professor Marcin Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of Sociology, which is located nearby on the same campus, I would like to welcome everyone present here and wish you a very productive and nice conference. We are very proud to have so many distinguished professors and uh, specialists in the, field, in the field of sociology of work. I hope that you will have interesting discussions and uh, that some uh, provocative issues will be raised and discussed and debated. Uh, and uh, I hope it will be a very interesting intellectual uh, initiative started by, uh, Professor, by, by our colleague Adam Rosowicki. And uh, in short, I, I wish you a very pleasant stay here on the campus and in Wrocław. As uh, the Dean says, uh, said before, I hope you will have some time to visit Wrocław because it is a very nice city. We are proud to live here and that you will have some time to have informal discussions with uh, our colleagues. And uh, also, uh, those of you who are interested in change, I encourage you to explore the surroundings since, as you probably know, this place used to belong to the Prussian army, then to the German army, then to the Red Army, and now it is the Department of the Social Sciences. Those of you who are receptive can still see some inscriptions in Russian nearby in the, on the campus. So, apart from those intellectual experiences, I wish you all the best in, you know, in visiting Wrocław and profiting from the stay here at the, at, on the campus. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, well, we are ahead of time, which is good, which is a good sign for the rest of the conference. Uh, so, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to invite uh, Professor Guy Standing, uh, our keynote speaker for this morning. Uh, uh, I don't need to introduce, introduce uh, Professor Standing. He's an uh, economist, uh, sociologist, uh, great defender of the basic income, uh, and the proponent of uh, the uh, discussion, uh, one of the key figures in the discussion of precarious work and precariat. Uh, and uh, so we will have the keynote speech uh, of Professor Standing, which will be followed uh, by the discussion chaired by Professor Juliusz Gardawski. Uh, uh, and the uh, discussion will uh, involve uh, Professor Krzysztofa uh, Professor Jane Harder, and uh, Maciej uh, Schindler. So, uh, at the beginning, uh, Professor Sandy. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, it's been a very intensive first visit to this lovely city. And actually, my experience of being here reminds me very much of my subject this morning because they've made me work so hard 
since I arrived that I know little about the beauty of the city except for going between places where I'm speaking. And it, it is really uh, relevant for my analysis, but I would like to say that the warmth of welcome uh, has been fantastic and I really appreciate it. The second introductory point I'd like to make is that as an academic and as an activist, one goes to numerous conferences around the world uh, in many different cultures, but it's very rare that one comes to a conference when one looks at the program and would like to go to all the sessions, except one that's in Polish, because I can't speak Polish, but all the others uh, look so fascinating that one would like to be in all of them. Now, what I want to do in the next few minutes is develop a theme that is in uh, the book, The Precariat, and although it's been translated into many languages and numerous commentators have discussed it, attacked it, or supported it, or whatever, there's one area which I think has attracted uh, ridiculously little attention. And I have always regarded it as very important for understanding the growth of the precariat. And it, it leads to the policy proposals I've put in the, in the new book, the Precariat Char Charter, that's just come out. Now, time. Time. Time is an asset. It's precious. It's absolutely crucial for a good life. And yet, we have no politics of time. And in our lifetime, we've seen a commodification of time. And a strange phenomenon of the development of what one would call contrived scarcity of time for use by ourselves to develop ourselves. And in that context, I was drawn in my work in the ILO to the dissatisfaction of the laborist model that was developed in state socialism under Lenin and under the welfare states of Western Europe, which put the performance of labor on a pedestal, as if that was the only use of time that was given value. And I was dissatisfied with that because it is highly sexist, it is highly hierarchical, and it abuses our notion of human, humanistic vision of time. And if you go back to ancient Greece, they had a much more rich and civilized conceptualization of time than we have had in modern society. And I want to mention a few key concepts that were developed in ancient Greece that are relevant for our imagination of time. The Greeks had, the Athenians had, the idea of thoroughbus. And thoroughbus was a concept to suggest that the noise of participating in life in the streets, in the squares, in the theatres, was part of our civilizing use of time and essential. And the other aspect, the concept that Aristotle developed was urgia, laziness, laziness. For the ancient Greeks, laziness was essential, absolutely vital to be a civilized human being. And there had to be space for laziness. And the Greeks differentiated between labor, which was for modern 
terms for exchange value. And it was done by the metics, the banside, the slaves, the non-citizens. And the rationale that the Greeks gave for not giving citizenship to those who performed labor is because they didn't have enough time to learn about civic involvement and learn how to be a political person. That was their rationale. One could accuse them of rationalization, but conceptually it's important. And labor was differentiated from work, praxis. Work was what the citizen did with his or her family, relatives, friends, around the home to strengthen what the Greeks called philia, civic friendship. Strengthening and reproducing relationships, personal relationships. That was work. It strengthened the values of empathy. The ability to put oneself in the position of the other in order to develop one's humanity. It's a very different concept <coughs> as survived in modern neoliberal work. But work as praxis was differentiated again from two other uses of time. The first was play, recreation. Play is necessary, athletics, leisure, enjoyment, sex, all of those things that make a necessary part of life. And play was for the restoration of the capacity for work. It was an essential part. It was integrated in that perspective. But the fourth use of time in ancient Greece was skolle, leisure. And leisure for the ancient Greeks was having this double meaning of learning, scholastic development, learning and liberating oneself through learning, and participation in the life of the voice, in the agora, in the open spaces. And that was regarded as the objective of citizenship. A citizen was one who was able to liberate enough time and energies and laziness in order to be reflective and to be participating in the life of the boss. And there's a famous statement which I quote in the book from later, from Cato. And Cato said, never is a man more active than when he's doing nothing. Because you need contemplation, you need the capacity to reflect in order to be able to be a citizen. Fundamentally important way of looking at it. Now go forward historically and you get to the physiocrats and the mercantilists of the Middle Ages. For them, suddenly, the only activity that was productive was agricultural labor. A very warped way of looking at the world. Go forward a little further and you get to Adam Smith, the founding father of modern economics. And in a passage that I quote, he dismissed all the activities of ethical service and work and thinking as unproductive. So the activities that everybody in this room spends most of their time doing, I'm afraid under Mr. Adam Smith, you're useless 
wasting your time because you're doing unproductive activity. <coughs> and his, just, his justification was that what you do disappears in the moment that you do it. A very strange mentality, but that mentality has permeated all the way down from 1776 into 2015, until next year. Adam Smith was not alone. Immanuel Kant said that anybody doing what we now call services should not be allowed to be citizens. Hello? I mean, what a work warped way of looking at life. We go forward a little further. In the early years of the United States, the rationale for not allowing laborers the right to vote was they didn't have property and therefore could not be full citizens. You go forward with the Marxists, the Social Democrats, and the development of laborism of the 20th century. And you get to the most stupid development of all. Only in the 20th century did it become the case that only labor counted as work. So we have the situation set not by a radical leftist or whatever, but by Arthur Pigou, an economist at Cambridge, who said in the early 1920s that if he hired a woman as a cook or a housekeeper, national income went up, employment went up, economic growth went up, unemployment went down. If he married her and she continued to do exactly the same work, national income goes down. Economic growth goes down, employment goes down, and unemployment goes up. Now, seriously, can you get more stupid than that? But still, our labor statistics in 2014 reflect that model. We only have a measure of people what they're doing in labor, not in work. So all the work that we all do, and particularly women, disappears statistically. It disappears from our sociological books. It disappears from our economic textbooks. We only talk about work if you're going out and taking a flipping job. Now, what sort of warped perspective have we allowed to persist into the 21st century? Now, leisure has also suffered historically. Leisure merged with play and recreation and free time to consume, to spend your time spending money. And if you remember the great book by Thorsten Veblen in 1899, The Theory of the Leisure Class, it's about vicarious consumption by bourgeois wives and mothers. Your role is to be consuming so that the system can keep going. A very alienated view of leisure, so that the whole essence of leisure in the Greek sense has been squeezed out. Your role is to labor and to consume. And if you can have the energy, you can watch football matches, drink a lot of beer, and do whatever else you want to do, but so that you can go laboring and consuming in a new dystopia of consumption and capitalism. Now let's think from another perspective about time. Time in agrarian societies, in rural societies, was dictated by the seasons, by the climate, by the demand of the crops and the animals. 
So everywhere you would have seen local time zones that were different from time zones in another village or another town. And people were not regimented by the clock or by daily <coughs> hours fixed in advance. And you see in those societies a huge number of holy days, holidays. Huge number. If you look back in the Middle Ages, say in Britain or in France, there were a huge number of holidays. And that was part of the socialization process. It was part of the politicization. It was part of the reproducing our relationships. Very important way of integration and developing a subversive counterculture against the state. But what happened then with the development of industrial capitalism? is that we suddenly had a move towards blocks of time. You get up in the morning, you go to the mine or the factory, you clock in, you work for 12 hours, you go to your home place, if you've got any energy, you have a bit of sex, and then you go to bed. You get up in the morning, same thing. Blocks of life. A few years of schooling, if you were lucky. 30 years of labor, if you were lucky. Two years of retirement, if you were lucky. Drop dead. Blocks. Now in such a life, the exploitation and oppression takes place in a fixed workplace as the norm. Not for everybody, but as the modal situation. And it makes sense to be having a class struggle for the liberation of time from labor. So that was the nature of the class struggle. But of course, the blocks of time approach meant two things. It meant a systematic development by the state to take away holidays. The incredible reduction in the number of holidays in the 19th and early part of the 20th century is a story that has not been told enough. That erosion of holidays gradually was replaced by the development of a 20th century concept called the weekend. The weekend. You remember, those of you who have seen the British television program, Downton Abbey, and the Dowager says a wonderful line when she says, What? What, my dear, is the weekend? The weekend only became something in the 1930s, first starting with half-day labour on Saturdays after Sunday, and then the full five-day, 40-hour week. But that was part of the regulations of labor. And it was part of a process that we call proletarianization. <coughs> proletarianization, as E.P. Thompson, a famous essay in 1967, he traced how the disciplining of people by the clock was a fundamental part of the development of industrial capitalism. What I think he and others, that's unfair probably, have not emphasized sufficiently is that disciplining process undermined human agency, undermined the capacity to be able to have that subversive sense of leisure and a counterculture. Now, things have changed dramatically since that era because with the collapse of industrial capitalism, which is very much tied up with the collapse of state communism and the welfare states, we have moved into an era 
of what I call in the book tertiary time. Instead of industrial time, tertiary time. And we have yet to come to terms conceptually or politically with tertiary time. What do I mean? Instead of blocks of time for labor and recreation, we now have a situation where every type of time use is invaded, is commodified, is subject to blurring of the boundaries. And in that respect, our statistics and our presentations have become more and more idiotic. Because more and more people, particularly in the precariat, have to do an incredible amount of work for labour that doesn't get counted statistically or remunerated or recognised. You have to do retraining. You have to prepare yourself. You have to do more retraining because you're not sure whether the previous retraining was going to lead to anything. You have to do more networking because you're not sure your networking was enough. You have to do more emailing because you're not sure if your last lot of emails is relevant. We are suffering this tertiarization process. And it's leading to a phenomenon of flitting. I don't know what is the best use of my time in order to be in control and have the optimum opportunities. And also, if you're in the precariat, the rate of return in economic sense from any retraining is very low. Because you don't know whether it's going to lead and you'll be obsolescent before you get a chance to use those new bag of tricks they call skills. And this flitting leads to what I've called the precariatized mind. I don't know what's the best use of my time, but I'm spending more and more of it doing more and more things. I got up at 6.30 this morning in order to do all my emails from the night. And after this, I'll be working and doing other things, and I'm sure you're all the same. More and more people are in this circumstance of not feeling any control over their time. Not only are people having to do more work for labor that doesn't get counted, they're having to do more work for their finances, more work for the state. If you're down in the precariat, all those forms you have to fill in, all those queuing that you have to take, to all those more queuing, being more polite to somebody. Now in any rational Martian society, all that activity would be called work. Because you're not doing it because you want to do it. You're doing it because you have to do it. And if you don't do it, you pay a price. And for the precariat, if they don't do it, they pay a bigger price than anybody else. And we're seeing that the utilitarian politicians are multiplying the amount of time that people in the precariat have to use in these respects. Queuing, waiting, waiting, doing this, doing that. None of it comes into our discussions of employment. But it isn't employment. What is it? We can't call it leisure. And yet, as a community of scholarship, We've hardly given it attention. Now, with tertiary time, you have what we economists, I'm an economist, apologies for that, we have a situation of unbounded rationality. Because it's very, very difficult to be rational in that circumstance. And we have a new phenomenon that's taking off 
that I haven't seen any sociological or economic analysis yet. It goes under the name, and I apologize for throwing in another concept, it goes under the name of heteromation. <coughs> Automation is the replacement of human labor by machines. Heteromation is actually the machines are getting us to do more and more work. The electronic system and all the developments in human resource management and so on is actually increasing the amount of time we have to devote to forms of work. But we haven't conceptualized what that implies. And the new development in the sphere of the labor process is what's called crowd labor. Crowd labor is predicted by the multinationals that are ru running it and making billions and billions of dollars already. That by the 2025, another 10 years or so, one in every three labor transactions will be done online in situations of what we call Dutch auctions. You know, uh, a firm will say we need such and such and such jobs being done and a provider, a labor broker gets in the middle and puts them out for contract and bidding. So you can bid for the thing and you'll say I'll do it for 10 euro and you do it, I'll do it for 5 euro and someone in, in Kenya will say I'll do it for 2 euro and the whole global labor process will be competing to the lowest level. Without contracts, without security, without... Labor. This is a new phenomenon that's developing electronically. Now, in the process, we have a huge development about the inequality of time. The inequality. If you're up here in the salariat or in the elite, you have control of your time. You can buy people to allow you to have your time. If you're down in the precariat, you have no control. Of so the inequality of time control is actually huge and is a fun fundamental part of the growth of inequalities in our modern society. Now what has happened on the other side to leisure in this story? Well, systematically, leisure in the Greek sense has been squeezed. More and more people will say, look, I don't have enough time to follow the policies. But what are these politicians talking about? I haven't got the time. They don't have time to learn civics about their history, their culture, their political ideologies. It doesn't get you a job. So why waste my time? I've got too many other things to do. I can't go to the theatre. I cannot go to great art. I haven't got the time. That gets squeezed. And obviously the consequence of that is you get people who don't understand democracy or listen to the commodified politicians who talk in sound bites and who look good on television because I don't know anything about these things. That's the feeling. I don't have time. He sounds better than him, so I might as well vote for him. I was listening about a crazy polit uh, Polish politician last night who absolutely is clearly certifiable. He should be in an institution. But he's just been elected a member of the European Parliament. Because he, he sounds nice. But if you think you've got a privilege in that respect in Poland, come to the United Kingdom as, as we would tell you. We've got a certain Mr. Nigel Farage, who is clearly also in that category. But because he sounds a bit stupid and, you know, like a bloke, drinks a lot of beer, he's getting a lot of support. Because people don't have enough time to really go into the issues. But it's happening everywhere. And this political erosion of time goes with the
denigration by everybody in mainstream thinking and politics of the value of urgia, of laziness. In our modern society, laziness has been converted into a sin. It's a sin to be lazy. Well, let me tell you that it ain't a sin. It's necessary to be a human being and a civilized person. Now to conclude, I think we really need a politics of time to combat both laborism and the insecurities of the precariat. In my new book, The Charter, I've got a program which I think addresses the problem. But the one thing I want to emphasize is that one of the reasons I propose a basic income as part of the new civilizing agenda to confront these problems, I've actually proposed that the only condition I would apply is that when you start getting entitled to your basic income, you sign a statement, a moral commitment, that you will vote in national elections and participate in at least one day a year that will become a deliberation day where you go to political meetings and you participate and listen to the various points of view. As it happens, in 451 BC, Pericles, in Athens, did approximately like that. He paid people in order to encourage them to be using their time in the life of the polis. It was a beautiful moment. And I had the great privilege earlier this year to go to the one, one of the great wonders of our European civilization. I went to Paestum. It's an event that I will never forget. Paestum was an ancient Greek city in southern Italy that for hundreds of years was lost, covered in forest and so on. And in 1737, Goethe was one of the first to actually go there, and he felt the wonder of that city. If you ever get a chance, go there. Because in the center of Paestum, with these three wonderful Greek temples that still stand, there's a circle about the size of this room, with layers going down, it was called the Ecclesiastion. And whenever the people of Paestum wanted to develop a new policy, 500 went, 500 people would go to the circle and everybody had the chance to talk, listen, question, deliberate. It was a wonderful instrument of deliberative democracy. I'm not romanticizing too much because it was a sexist society, it was a slave society, but the concept of deliberative democracy runs contrary to all the commodification of politics that we're having today. But it requires Asia, Thoros, all the great Greek bad. For me, their way of looking at work and labor and leisure and play is something that we should resurrect in the 21st century. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Standing. Now I will, I will pass the microphone to Professor Juliusz Gardawski uh, will uh, chair the rest of the panel. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to, to invite to our panel group Pani Profesor Krystynę Janicką. Pani Profesor, proszę bardzo. 
Panią profesor Jane Hardy. Zapraszam. I pana doktora Macieja Schlindera, jeżeli się nie mylę, jeśli chodzi o tytuł naukowy. Jeszcze nie, zapraszam bardzo. Please take a place. Uh, my dear friends, I, I want to, to say some words on my uh, scientific way, but uh, I, I try to, to, to start with a Polish, uh, short Polish speak, and, and then I will try to introduce it in, uh, in, in English as well. Proszę, proszę Państwa, jestem wyjątkowo wzruszony. Jestem wyjątkowo wzruszony, dlatego że miałem okazję przez wiele, wiele lat, począwszy od 30 lat wstecz, przez 10 lat, robić badania klasy robotniczej w Polsce. I był taki okres, w którym wydawało mi się, nie do końca była to prawda, ponieważ ośrodek wrocławski też działał w tym pole, jeśli chodzi o duże badania, Wydawało mi się, że jestem jedynym, który prowadzi badania klasy robot, robotniczej w owym czasie w Polsce. Wtedy, kiedy myśmy robili te badania, ja z grupą przyjaciół, w Polsce mieliśmy do czynienia z skrajnie odmiennym światem. Skrajnie odmiennym światem. Ten świat przypominał ten brytyjski świat opisywany przez Goldorpa, przez Lockwooda, przez Franka Parkina. Affluent, affluent working class. Myśmy mieli dokładnie tę samą sytuację. Ta klasa robotnicza, ja wtedy miałem okazję ją badać, zaakceptowała kapitalizm i gospodarkę rynkową, chociaż w bardzo ograniczonym wymiarze, ale zaakceptowała. I wtedy, kiedy ja kończyłem badania klasy robotniczej, te duże badania, to był 94 rok, Myśmy jeszcze nie mieli do czynienia z prekariatem. Był oczywiście podział na to, co się nazywa core i periphery, ale, ani, ale te nasze periphery miały niewiele wspólnego z dzisiejszym prekariatem. To były periphery stosunkowo bezpieczne, mimo że teraz nam ta historia się nieco skraca. Lęk przed bezrobociem i rodzące się bezrobocie było niewielkie. To było, ja zakończyłem te badania, później zajmowałem się głównie związkami zawodowymi, instytucjami raczej, teraz małą i średnią przedsiębiorczością, skończyłem 20 lat temu. A więc jest okazja, żeby zadać pytanie za chwilę Państwu o to, co przez te 20 lat, kiedy Gardawski zajmował się związkami zawodowymi, instytucjami, stało się z klasą robotniczą. Chcę na wstępie bardzo jeszcze raz podziękować Adamowi Brozowickiemu, bo powtórzę tym, od czego zacząłem. To jest wzruszająca sprawa, kiedy ma się poczucie, że ten obszar badawczy, który się pozostawiło, trafia w dobre ręce. Pięknie dziękuję Adamie. So, I, I, I want to say that I was interested in working class, Polish working class, since 1984. My interest was focused around various aspirations attitudes of Polish working class in the period when our investigation showed us that, that uh, this, 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 this working class is very similar to British working class carried out by Gold, Goldorp, Lakewood, uh, effluent workers and especially, especially by Frank Parkin. We found the same attitudes, the same mentality in 1985-1990 Uh, as Lockwood in 1970, 1975 in the United Kingdom. It was specific class, because it was class divided into core and periphery, but this periphery in Poland was nothing um, common with the uh, precariat, today precariat. It was another, another kind of, 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 of working class in general, another kind, kind of working class. So, I... Uh, I remember our last investigation in 1994. We tried to find attitudes toward capitalism. Capitalism in Poland was four years, four or five years. And we find that the Polish working class at that period accepted as well in, in, in 1989, but with boundaries, with, 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 some, with some moderation, of course. But in general, 
there was a specific attitudes that we uh, defined as a um, expectation of of um, friendly friendly market economy, but market economy, not economy like a communist economy on, on authoritarian socialism economy. So I'm very interesting. I my my last investigation was carried out in 1994, 20 years ago. So I'm interested in what happened with with. Uh, Polish working class in general, and with British working class, I remembered Frank Park in investigation in 1975, and uh, investigation of bourgeoisiation of, of working class. What 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 was a uh, what? How this 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 period? You can re reconstruct. You can say about it, because I uh, I have to say that this excellent lecture of uh, Professor Standing not only sociological but philosophical about condition of humanity in general so your lecture uh, give me an opportunity to ask you about about this this general problems of uh, um, inequalities in society and with the um, heritage of, of uh, former working class and situation a recent situation with working class Pani professor room is yours Firstly, I would like to uh, say that I am very impressed by the lecture, Professor Stenting's lecture. He, he gave us an overview of evolution of sense, um, the so basic uh, conception of uh, at, um, uh, this time. And uh, another work, he uh, analyzed uh, problem of uh, changing status of employment. Um, hearing the, the and read, reading and hearing the present standings um, work, works, um, I can't um, uh, imagine how this brilliant idea can be uh, transposed into a program of empirical in investigation uh, to a program how to check in which way this um, modern processes is uh, distributing, is uh, attacking people according to their position within social structure. We, because we can't deny it that the uh, traditionally conceived social structure um, has impact, all, all the time has impact on, on um, various domain of person's life. The, 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 the first step is necessary. The, the necessary step is to try, try to precise basic concept. We know that, for instance, precarity situation has many forms, and what is apparent, obvious, in the fact, it is not so. so. But um, returning to, to the uh, more concrete uh, question, I would like. Um, um, stress also that um, in Polish sociology, um, but uh, I, I am not a specialist in, in sociology of work. Uh, I was engaged in, in many, for many years in um, investigation on social structure. And um, I would like to stress that the situation of work um, was in center of a um, large project conducted from uh, the turn of 60s uh, up to now. And um, this uh, uh, concept of work was defined in a very um, sophisticated way. Um, work was uh, um, conceived as an occupational self-direction, as a multi-level a concept combining of such a, a characteristic as um, 
complexity of work in different dimensions. For instance, work with data, people, uh, information, um, of uh, scope, level of routinization of work and subordination. And this uh, characteristic was very specific. The, the, um, uh, for position, structural position. And uh, moreover, it can be proved that the level of occupational self-direction has real effect on psychological, psychological functioning. This project um, originated in the United States uh, uh, Author was, uh, has been authored by Melvin Kohn and Carly Schuller. And the main um, assumption of this project was that um, quality and complexity of work is a main uh, factor of, of um, uh, reproduction of social structure. And I am con convinced that um, it is also, uh, it, it, it works now, but um, we should add another dimension of, uh, of work situation, the status of employment, because it, the, the, this um, original project was concentrated on the content of work. So, um, uh, I hope that uh, during discussion uh, in our conference we will uh, elaborate perhaps uh, <laughs> with uh, perhaps a uh, more, more empirical approach, more uh, practical approach um, to, to, uh, uh, to try catch this uh, pivotal processes. Yes. But what, what about the uh, worker situation? Um, having, 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 having data from um, longitudinal data, uh, panel data, which enable us to, uh, to follow the um, uh, subsequent um, phase of one's uh, life, uh, we could uh, state the situation of, of, um, worker, of uh, workers um, is, um, has been worse. Has been worse. Um, working class. It is a conscious. Class, uh, workers class will be this classness. Classness. Of in Poland in general. <coughs> Observing how the different uh, part of um, um, posi of social position um, is correlated. I mean the objective as aspects and subjective one. Uh, we can argue that in Polish social, social, sociology, uh, the polarization is um, uh, um, is quite uh, obvious. Um, from the other side of of um, the problem, um, when we um, asking, for instance, how people see that different kind of conflicts to be in society, um, it's rather difficult to um, discover the very clear pattern which is situated workers in a special uh, position. Um, there are um, some kind of conviction, opinion, orientation are dispersed among workers. To my opinion, it may be results of atomization uh, and uh, is, um, uh, the fact that the um, workers nowadays um, haven't 
enough representation, the interests, and as I another explanation, one can say that this process of uh, uh, disintegration, which is which may be observed on subjective level, is an effect of adaptation uh, to, to this uh, to requirement of, of the reality. So this things for, for a moment. Thank you very much, Pani Professor. It's uh, very interesting because in Poland there is a discussion on uh, working class uh, as, as, uh, it's not maybe very in intensive, but there, there are ma many positions, many points of view. For example, I, I'm sure that we have a working class, not only precarious, but working class. Of course, new working class, new type of working class, not for this working class. Um, right now, I want to, uh, to, to invite Pani Professor Hardy. Szanowni Państwo, excuse me, Szanowni Państwo, my znamy teksty profesor Hardy, są bardzo popularne, są tłumaczone na polski, także jest mi bardzo miło, że mogę powitać Panią Profesor. We know your text, your text are translated into Polish, you are cited very, very, very often in Poland. It's a very nice to meet you, to, to meet you. Pani Profesor Romsiur. Thank you very much and also thank you for the invitation to speak here. And um, I'm very, very pleased to see um, so many friends who gave me such a, a good understanding in um, thinking about the Polish working class. Now, um, I just want to start my comments on Guy's book by acknowledging what a, an enormous success it's been in provoking a discussion on a, a global scale, I think you've spoken all over the world, and what it reflects is a real concern that people have about the huge insecurities, the inequalities, uh, and the degradation of, of work that people are experiencing. And I think another important point that Guy hinted at and that he discusses in his book is the way that, if you like, the lack of quality of work can also be understood in terms of contributing to a resurgence of some very nasty ideas, not only in Britain, but right across Europe. Now, um, what I'm going to propose is, I hope, um, a friendly critique of Guy's book. And I'm going to do it um, centering on four uh, propositions, stroke, <coughs> provocations that I, I think that we need to think about. Because I think Guy's book represents not the end of a debate, but really the beginning of a debate. And it invites us, um, as the last speaker says, to think really more sharply about a number of questions. And the first um, proposition, provocation that I have, is that if we're talking about precarity, then we need to set it much more firmly in a historical context of capitalism. Now in his book, Guy gives a, a, a specific definition of non-precarious work, and he describes this as workers in long-term stable, fixed hour jobs with established routes of advancement, subject to unionisation and collective agreements with job titles their mothers and fathers understood, facing local employers whose names and features they were familiar with. Now this is the sort of benchmark that Guy uses. And I think that this benchmark is really very limited both in time and in space. So for example, um, that period of work really only refers to a particular period of time, I would say, post-1945. 
And in Britain, even a very generous reading um, only includes about three decades in the post-war period. In the Global South, I'm not sure that this sort of description has ever applied to anything more than a very <coughs> small group of people. Also, I don't think we should be looking at these jobs if they ever existed through any sort of rose-tinted glasses. And, uh, for example, if you take working for Ford, and if you have done the sociology of work, you'll be familiar with this book. It's an iconic book um, written by someone called Hugh Bainan, who actually worked there, about the absolute tedium and boring repetitiousness of working in those sort of conditions. And again, thinking more locally about Wrocław in the Polar factory, where um, I did a few interviews, well, quite a lot of interviews with women that work there. Again, despite the fact they've tried to casualise work in that factory, there was nothing romantic about the lives and the work that those women did um, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, okay, and, and just in relation to Guy's very stimulating discussion about time, wasting time looking for work is not something that is simply a modern phenomenon. In Britain in the 1880s, 150,000 people in the East End of London depended on their livelihood in working in the docks. Only 10% of people had a full-time contract. All the other workers queued up every day to see if they could get a ticket in order to work. So I think we have to be careful about not putting, if you like, new wine in old, in old bottles. Okay, if I talk for too long, you might have to stop me. <laughs> The second proposition that, and provocation is I think we have to dismantle this myth of um, a privileged salariat. And um, this group is supposedly characterised by permanent work, guaranteed hours, pensions, and are deemed to be a sort of separate and privileged class. And I think for anybody who works in the public sector, including university lecturers, um, would see that as denying the realities of working lives in the public sector, which have been subject to marketisation, commodification, and on the end of the, the, the brunt of austerity. In the case of the UK, I think the highest number of um, precarious workers, people on poor contracts work for Tesco's, and we all know about Tesco's, and the second group of people are young university workers, and I think that's, um, that's very important. If you take um, the Polish public sector, and again a few years ago I did quite a lot of interviews with nurses and teachers about their jobs, which actually fit the characteristics of the salariat, but they face, again, a different sort of precariousness. A sort of precariousness which means you're not sure if you can pay your bills at the end of the month. And um, one of the articles that I wrote about nurses, I took the title from a quote that one of the nurses made. She said that her husband said to her, darling, your um, salary is so low that you're just working for juice, coffee and cheap cosmetics. So I think we have to be more precise about precariousness and for low paid workers, even if they have job security, they face a different sort of uh, precarity. Um, and in the public sector, again, people experience and actually people survey show that people feel precarious. And the reason for that is to do with the way that they're managed, managed, and I think this is probably true of Poland, but there is something called new public sector management. And it means that everything is measured, every moment of our time, where we publish, what the students say, and this has led in all sectors to stress, 
to bullying and to, and to mobbing. So that was the second proposition, that we need to, um, we need to challenge this idea that also Zizek talks about, of a privileged salariat. The third provocation is that actually I think we need to shift from talking about a precariat as a separate class to talking about a working class which faces increasingly precarious conditions. And those are two separate things. Um, I've already argued that, that the guy's benchmark is, is rather restricted in time and space. But of course, there is nothing fixed about the working class and its composition and the jobs that it does. It's something that constantly uh, changes. Today, um, in many countries, not true of China, there are as many white-collar workers, people in call centres, as there are people who are blue-collar workers. And it's absolutely um, undeniable that precariousness under neoliberalism exists. But that is not the same thing as there being a separate, limited, uh, precar precarious class. And I think this was a point that you made, that we have to be very careful um, to treat it as a, a scientific concept. It's actually a very chaotic idea, a very chaotic concept which includes a, a, an enormous range of people, the student, labour force, temporary and contract workers, interns, elderly workers, migrant workers, and so on. So, under capitalism, there have always been you know, a huge menu and variety of different sorts of um, contracts. And I think we have to talk about a working class who are differentiated by the sort of contracts they have and by the nature of work and emphasise and go back to a basic point that what unites all of these workers, I would say, is the notion of exploitation. Um, and from the point of view either of a social scientist or a sociologist of work or indeed an activist, we need to look at the specifics of these sectors and workplaces so that we can actually devise strategies to um, look at what unites workers. So I think you know, we should, we're not in the game of a, of a competition of who is the worst exploited. The task is to look at commonalities between workers and look at how built bridges can be built between different groups of people. And I'll give you a very, very specific example of that from the UK. Um, in our union there is a very big dispute for one group of workers about their pensions and that's a very real and important dispute. And on the other hand, in the institution in which Guy works, there is a very big dispute about terrible treatment of young lecturers, PhD students. So the question is not to see these groups as separate, but to actually have some commonality and look at a strategy where they can, um, they can deal with both of these issues. And finally, this is my fourth point, I think we should be optimistic about the objective and the subjective potential of working class, and I do use that word deliberately, to organise. There are a lot of hostile forces who like to stress atomisation, fragmentation and powerlessness. It's in their interests to carry on this narrative as a way of undermining people. Subjectively, workers have managed to organise under you know, the most difficult conditions. For example, the dock workers that I, I, um, that I talked about in Britain in the 1880s um, were not a homogenous group of, of workers. It was incredibly hierarchical, they were geographically spread out, 
There was hostility to Irish migrant workers, and yet they managed to come together in order to found a new step of unionisation in the UK. In the US, the trade union movement, or one element of it, was built by precarious migrant workers. And if you look at the work of um, a writer called um, Ruth Milkman, she has continued to document the way in which migrant workers have organised under the most difficult circumstances. And um, finally, today people quite often cite fast food restaurants as places that are terrible to work, which they are, they're badly paid, they are, and yet in America they've had, in 150 cities, workers who have been on strike for a minimum wage of $15. $15. So I think we need to be optimistic about the possibility of even the most um, the workers at the bottom of the pile in terms of contracts and their ability to organise. Final few comments, if, if, if that's all right. So, um, you know, to conclude, again, I, you know, I really do genuinely congratulate Guy on the spirit of the book, The Precariat, because what it's done is it's brought not just to the academic world, but to activists, lay people, um, a real interest in people's working lives under capitalism. But I think the challenge is to see those on precarious contracts as part of the working class and not as a separate entity. I don't think we should regard them as the replacement of one class by another, but generally by a concerted attack by capital to take back from a generation of workers who had perhaps more reasonable working conditions and roll back those gains and re-establish control by capital. And of course, any attempt by um, a movement to win decent work must have an agenda of equality based on gender, based on race, and also based on migrant workers right at the centre. So just to conclude, those people on temporary or part-time contracts have not got distinct interests from those in full-time and unionised jobs. And it's only looking by the commonalities between them and what unites them that there is a chance of securing decent work for everybody. Thank you very much. From my perspective, uh, the indispensable historical analysis uh, is especially important and we can use it in uh, current struggles. That's why I would like to, to make just three short uh, points, all of which will be more political. Uh, then descriptive or uh, analytical. One about the notion of precariat, the second about the notion of class, and the third about the, the idea of, uh, of basic income. Uh, using the notion of uh, precariat has several advantages, which can be seen even more clearly uh, in the Polish context. It is an answer to the need of creating new, politically effective language uh, that has not been worn out by the decades of iteration depriving some words of their meaning, like in the years of the so-called real socialism in Poland and many other East Central European countries. Moreover, uh, the notion of precariat, by pointing precisely to the existential experience of chronic insecurity uh, of many different groups, can function as a not so empty signifier, to use partly the concept of Ernesto Laclau, which can join and articulate their demands. And this advantage of being close to the real experiences is especially visible here. In Poland, the country with uh, large income inequalities, the rates of employment amounting to only about 60%, with more than a quarter of it being a temporal employment, and uh, wage share in GDP, gross domestic product, slightly exceeding uh, uh, 54%, which is one of the lowest in the European Union. 
In the country of rising xenophobia and hostility towards non-Polish, uh, non-Catholic, non-white, and not heterosexual, where fighting violence against women is perceived as a cultural attack on tradition, and where the private property has the priority over the right to housing. Without doubt, the Polish society is one of the most precarious societies in Europe. Secondly, I'm very happy about the, uh, the precarious class, not because it's analytically strict, but because it relates to the fundamental idea of class struggle. All classes fully constitute themselves in the process of struggling for the collective goals. In this sense, precariat as a fighting class could be seen on the Spanish streets and squares during the rise of the 15N movement, so-called Indignados. It could be seen occupying public and common spaces in North America. It could be seen in the huge protests and manifestations for regaining the commons in Italy and in many other places. All of the mentioned movements, but not only them, has included in their lists of claims, their political postulates, the demand for unconditional basic income. And that's my third point. It was one of the five main claims uh, risen by the 15M, 15M movement, a part of the May Day Manifesto, one of the goals of the metropolitan welfare struggles apart from uh, free transport and water in Italy. Basic income to define uh, for, the, for those who maybe don't know the, the idea, is an unconditional, so paid without any requirements connected with the former or future behavior, universal, so paid to every citizen or resident, and individual, paid to every individual, not family, regular cash transfer paid by the state or other smaller or bigger political entity. Unconditional basic income would not only be a way of eliminating poverty and providing everyone the basic security, which the precariat lacks and needs so much, but by guaranteeing everyone money on the sufficient level, it would give them the control over time and possibility to make sensible plans of their future. It would also strengthen the bargaining position of the workers, it could be the way to improve labor conditions, as well as increase wages and salaries, aggregated effective demand, production and employment rates. But what is even more important, providing the quality time uh, would broaden the possibility to prepare and organize the collective resistance and political activity <coughs> aimed at realizing other progressive goals, like stopping the privatization of the public sector or regaining the commons. That's why unconditional basic income should be one of the main demands of the struggling precariat as a class, hopefully also in Poland. Thank you very much. My intention uh, was to add some uh, more general remarks concerning the privatization and uh, tertiarization. Uh, these processes, which one is uh, connected to in logic of uh, liberal economy and globalization, uh, in global uh, condition in glo within globalization, and another with uh, um, technological uh, processes. Um, act, uh, acting not in the uh, social vacuum. Uh, the, the act within a framework on a concrete society uh, who are on, which is on a given level of general development and uh, in the investigation practice we should ask about intercountry uh, specifics or differentiation um, which uh, Characterize this uh, processes uh, in, in this specific society. And another another remarks concern the, um, uh, the role of these two processes with within strengthening strengthening making for for much more pr pronounced traditional conceived social structure or weakening it. So thanks very much.
Thank you very much for sustaining your comments. Well, I won't uh, elaborate. I've been talking in the last couple of days, and some of you probably were at the presentation of the book the night before last when it was published in Polish. Many of the points that uh, Jane has mentioned, uh, I've answered uh, more systematically in my new book, which is available in English, and it's just come out in Russian, but uh, I've got some copies of the English version here if you're interested. But let me answer just a few of her points. I strongly believe that if any concept is chaotic, and that's an insulting term, if any, uh, any such concept is chaotic, it is the concept of the working class. When people accuse me of the precariat being, you know, a lot of different people, well, you can certainly say that about the concept of the working class. It's much bigger and broader and fuzzier and so on. And one of the issues I think that I've tried to explore is the development of class fragmentation in the late 20th century under neoliberalism. And when I use the concept of the salariat, the salariat are people not only with long-term employment security and all the benefits of pensions and paid holidays and all those things, but they're getting an increasing proportion of their total income from capital in various ways, from shares, from equities, from bonuses linked to performance. In Germany, for example, the salariat that I'm talking about gets almost half of their total income from capital, not from wages. This means that materially they have a difference of interest from the precariat, which gets none of that income from capital, and actually they benefit from raising profits and lowering wages because they get more, more income. It's exactly the same in the United States. The salariat are getting an increasing proportion of their income from capital not from wages. So I think you have to differentiate. Now, I've argued in the books, and including in the first longer book, that one of the mistakes of laborism of the 20th century was the systematic dismantling of all institutions of social solidarity, including occupational guilds. The traditions of the occupational guilds was actually opposed by the laborist agenda of the 20th century, systematically dismantling in a, a zone that gave rights and citizenship within an occupational focus. And we saw that in the New Labour period in Britain where the unions were completely silent when institutional changes were being made in regulations to take away professions and crafts' ability to self-regulate. This was a very fundamental part of laborism. Now, I had the privilege, or otherwise, of working for 30 years in the International Labour Organization. And the International Labour Organization from 1919 until today has been defending laborism against a wider ideas of work and emancipation. And the 1952 International Labour Convention on Social Security, which in 2001 the trade unions of the world joined the employers of the world, saying it is still up to date. Well, I recommend all of you, if you take a bath, as I like to take a bath, and you want to keep the water in the bath hot, then read Convention 102 in the bath, because your blood pressure will rise, to such an extent that it will keep the water warm. 
It's the most sexist, hierarchical view of a breadwinner, dependent wife, treating women differently from men. And the trade unions of the world declared it up to date in 2001. It tells you a lot. If you're talking to a precariat group, sadly, because I've been a union member all my life, and I will continue to be a union member. But sadly, if you want to clear the room and get everybody rushing for a bar to have a few drinks, you start talking about the labor unions. The precariat does not identify with the labor unions. Why not? Because their conceptualization of the good life and the good work and control of time and control of the commons, the commons, quality public space, which the precariat needs in which to survive. That was never really part of the laborist agenda. And I give some examples in the Spanish edition of my book because it's happened in Spain a lot, is that whenever it's come to a decision about whether we favor the environment and the ecological development and the commons versus jobs, Jobs. Jobs. The unions and the representatives of laborism have gone to jobs, not for the environment. And that's a factor. Now, I think I'm very pleased, incidentally, that our mutual friend, uh, Ruth Milkman, who was mentioned by Jane, has endorsed my new book, and I was staying with her uh, four days ago. And I think she understands that the precariat agenda, politically, is different from the old so-called working class. It's a different agenda. And what I've done in the new book, I asked the question, I said, next year, next year is the 800th anniversary of the founding document of most constitutions. And really, it was a class-based demand against the state. And if we were to have a Magna Carta, a precariat carta, a charter for the 21st century, what would it look like? What would be the priorities and, and aspirations that would go into that? What sort of freedom, concept of freedom, would we put in? And then I say, what, how would it differ from a proletariat charter, if there had been one, a hundred years ago. That's the, that's the challenge I set in, in, in the new book. And I think this very sense of emancipation and equality is fundamentally different if you see it from the perspective of the precariat than if you see it from the perspective of the proletariat. Now, whether the proletariat was a short period or a long period is a matter of historical debate. But the norms established that went into the ILO norms of laborism are still with us today. And they are not the norms that go with that perspective I was trying to give uh, in my speech. But I fully agree with Jane that we are in a fascinating period intellectually and politically, when a lot of the old certainties are dead, a lot of the old vocabulary, and I, I really appreciated that point, the vocabulary is dead. And it doesn't resonate with young, educated people. This is the first time in history when a new part of the working class or a new class, where the level of education is greater than the level of labor they're expected to perform. It's fundamentally different from the old case of the dockers. There was always casualization. That's not important. You define the precariat in the three Marxist levels, and I apologize for saying that. Distinctive relations of production, distinctive relations of distribution, type of payment, type of reward, and distinctive relations to the state. This is the first time in history when an emerging class is having rights taken away from it. 
that were the rights of citizenship established in the preceding period. If you're in the precariat, you are losing civil rights every day. You're losing cultural rights every day. You're losing political rights every day. You're losing social rights every day. And you're losing economic rights. And I document that in the new book, and I think that that will define, because we are what, and the English word is denizens. Non-citizens, but in the society in which citizenship is put up here. So this is a new vocabulary, a new agenda, but I really urge all of us to be thinking constructively about building an alternative perspective. And I, as I said, I agree with Jane that we are at the beginning of that process. But it's attendant on us, all of us, to open our minds to new concepts and new ways of looking at things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, um, just to be clear, of course, globally, with globalisation, time, space compression, as David Harvey talks about, there are always new agendas. There is an ever-changing working class. And of course, the um, challenge is to address that. And my point is that we have to understand precarity in a very concrete way, in time and in space, if it's something that we can address. And I'm just, I could take lots of examples, but I'll only take one. And let's take an example that's close to both of us, which is in 2004, something like 800,000 Polish workers came to the UK to work. Now, many of them came as precarious workers in the sense that they did jobs that weren't unionised, that, uh, that they were employed by agencies and on very poor contracts. Now, you know, how was that tackled? The way that it was tackled, to varying degrees, was by the organised trade unions. Now, they didn't all respond well, but some uh, responded extremely well. They recruited uh, Polish labour organisers, they, they uh, got translators, they fought in a number of industries to get workers off those precarious contracts and into work. And on several unions, and on several UK union executives, for example the Bakers Union, there are now Polish workers participating. So what I'm urging is that, 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 that not that precarity doesn't exist, that precarious workers as an ossified group don't exist, and that as sociologists, social scientists and activists, we have to be concrete about precarity, and we have to look at how groups can work together in terms of commonalities, because it's not in the interest of organised workers to have lots of people on poor contracts, what the joint aims are and how those workers can work together. So I think we have to move from the very general to the very specific if it's an issue that we're going to address. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Paul Stewart, um, coordinator, uh, Marie Curie Change and Employment Programme, University of Strathclyde. Thank you, Guy, and the other speakers and Jane's contribution. Um, difficult to know where to start with Guy's um, contribution. Um, I take issue with all of it. Um, I would first start by saying that it is really important that I think for the first time globally someone has begun to think about the uneven distribution of power and GDP um, globally, um, away from labour <coughs> to capital no more, more evidently than in the United States and the UK, um, as James alluded to. I think, I, I, I recognise that, um, as the Polish colleague said, that there, there can be a problem with concepts and ideas and the resonance that these have from another period of repression, a long period of repression. I think, however, when we talk about the precariat or class. I think 
I think it's okay to say that some things are okay, that, that concepts are used and that, that people put together ideas in, in a chaotic way. Um, and I'm with Guy. The problem I have is that in, in one way I completely agree with him, um, and in another way when I look at the detail it, it doesn't really stack up. And as I wanted to say, I, I agree with everything that Jane said, therefore why, why, why repeat it. Just the last point that Guy made, and it, it's resonance, uh, uh, you talk about the state, the cap, by capital, the working class, uh, it's used by the left in a chaotic way, and then you defer to a notion of class in the state, and I'm thinking, what, what do you mean by that? It, uh, are you using these things in a kind of heuristic way? Do you, do you really mean it when you say that the interests of the precariat are different from the in interests of organised labour? And I wonder, would you talk about the every day by day assault on, on the rights of the precariat? And I'm wondering who, you know, how did those rights, who, who established those rights? They weren't given <laughs> but, you know, by, by the capitalist state. Those were fought for by organised labour principally. And undermining the rights of organised labour, people who were either, who were either now born into precarious employment or who were formerly organised workers and now become precarious, it's not in the interests of of precarious workers, that their class gets bigger. Why do we want the precarious? I don't want the class precarious workers. You're in a union, I'm assuming this is you, CEU. We're fighting against precarity. Five years ago, the majority of people in universities were in full-time employment. The attack, the marketization, commercialization, the capitalization of public universities in Britain has led to precarity. There's a, so it's about relationships here. And I think that, that's my problem. That when, and by bits and pieces of what you say makes sense. When you look at it together, it it, it doesn't it, it doesn't have coherent. I mean, it may have coherence to you in a heuristic way, but I can't see the systematic attempt to link different social classes together. Whatever we say about class, and you may say the working class is fuzzy, and it's it's about relationships, relations with other classes. So either you want the precarity to get bigger, what do you want to happen to the precariat? Not just that they all have a decent wage. The problems we have trying to protect your pensions, can you imagine tens of millions of people? Well, you know, I don't think so. 45 young students were murdered in Mexico recently because they challenged a, a local, a, a, you know, a local mayor. Try, you know, organised organised labour trying to protect its rights. The enormous problems we have. So, okay, uh, a living wage for everybody. How do we get it? And who, who are we going to have to fight to get it? And can I keep my job, my, my full time job, please? Thank you very much. Hello, Sylvie Contrepoix from London Met University. Um, I'm very interested uh, uh, about what you said on the citizenship and um, the way it can develop through uh, participation to the, uh, to the police. Um, here, I'm not fully sure that we should oppose uh, leisure and work today. I know that you have um, you have a notion you, you have distinguished two notions in fact which are work and labor. So um, I propose to not distinguish them here. I'm, I'm French in fact, so we don't have this distinction in French. We have only the word travail. Uh, so I will uh, reflect in this perspective of uh, a unique work, uh, a unique word. Uh, sorry. Um, in fact, in, in, there, there are a lot of works uh, who have developed the idea, and I worked on, on that myself when I worked on the reduction in working time. Uh, the idea that, uh, of course, we need leisure, but also through work, we are developing oneself as uh, human beings, and we can emancipate oneself through our work. So there is a strong dimension, of course, under exploitation. It's very difficult to, to be the owner of your own work. In fact, you are alienated. So one of the big issues is how to be the real owner of your work. And this is a big debate when you, we have restructurations, for example. So this is at the core of the debate, to be the owner of your work and to, to, to can exercise your citizenship through your work. So 
So I think part of the class struggle is about that also. Um, and from this perspective, if I've got to, to analyze precariats, I would say that this is a super uh, alienation in the sense of precarious worker can never be the, be the owner of their work. And that at the moment I'm interviewing interns uh, who, are uh, who are studying and doing internship in companies. And one of the case study is about engineers. And it's very strong because those young engineers are really investing in their work, they are happy to do that. And when they have to, to go out of the company, when the internship is finished, they finally find, find out that they, they are losing something where they could exercise uh, part of their uh, reflection and all of the building themselves, in fact. So this is uh, my contribution. Thank you very much. I'm Gershmi Zsazsa from Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences uh, from University of Zagreb. Uh, first of all, I should stress that it was a very, very interesting and inspiring and lecture and debate and very uh, inspiring critical comments. Uh, and uh, it raised, I, I get many, many questions, at least 10, but since I do not want to misuse our precious time, I will uh, focus on uh, two issues. Uh, first is uh, concerning the, uh, to Professor uh, Standing. In your lecture, you said that uh, uh, industrial capitalism was collapsed and has, has declined in, in this sense. So I'm not sure whether it is really so or it's just be, has been transforming uh, towards uh, informational type of production, as it, for instance, Castle says. Uh, since uh, industrial types of production uh, has not been uh, expiring, uh, it's just been uh, dislocated to the other, other global regions, for instance, Asia, Asian countries, China, India, Pakistan, and others. So uh, I wonder uh, in which sense or whether we uh, these categories of tertiary time, precariousness, can be applied in equal sense to these countries as it has been applied to the most advanced, most developed countries in Europe, uh, US, United States, uh, Japan, and in other countries. Uh, the second issue I would like to hear uh, your comments is uh, related to this uh, concept of basic income. Uh, the very interesting case concerning this idea was a referendum in Switzerland last year and the uh, majority of citizens uh, did not accept this idea, this proposal of uh, introducing basic income and I would like to hear your comments on failure of this referendum. Thank you very much. And the I would like to uh, say that uh, the main uh, answer to the question about uh, what happened with Polish workers during the last time uh, isn't central uh, yes, but it is unclear. Uh, the cause of situation, I think, is uh, next. I would like to ask, uh, especially Professor Standing, uh, if uh, we have answer that uh, the change of Polish workers is uh, precarious, and you uh, say that uh, it is a part of working class and you write, uh, write uh, that uh, it is a danger class. My question is, danger for who? For which class? It is the uh, one question. And the second question is uh, for uh, all the spirit of discussion. We uh, have uh, to, uh, to inform and uh, we uh, were informed 
about the problems uh, about uh, sociological research on working class. It was a very important, uh, not uh, only a problem, but a task. It was uh, very good about uh, the past. What is for today? Uh, what is for today with uh, research, but research um, in the character of comparison of social class, <coughs> social workers in uh, many countries, not only in Poland. Uh, and my question is, it is uh, the kind of uh, uh, research, sociological research for today and <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. My name is Vasil Kirov, I'm from the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and from the University of Evry. I would like to thank you for this very interesting lecture and discussion. To thank Jane Hardy for bringing uh, the idea of contextualizing, for example, this idea of pre income precariousness, uh, public sector in Central and Eastern Europe. And I have a question for Guy Standing. You mentioned the incredible development of crowd labor and crowdsourcing, and uh, there are different estimations of the importance it will take in following years. And it's clear that part of these very highly educated, precarious, young, precarious workers are more and more in, uh, involved in crowdsourcing. There are some new studies showing emergence of collective actions within, within uh, crowd work. Could you comment a little bit how do you see this development? Because it would be interesting from the point of view of development of the precariat. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wojciech Figiel, University of Warsaw, surprise, surprise, Faculty of Applied Linguistics. So I share Professor Standing's uh, feeling that I'm an outsider here because I mainly deal with translation studies and discourse analysis. And uh, I want to have, uh, I want to take one comment and, and ask two questions. And thank Professor Standing for an outstanding lecture. <laughs> And my comment is that I very much appreciate what you said because I feel it's related to my academic practice. Like I know that today I have to collect a stamp and after I go back to my university and it's very hard for me as a partially sighted person to fill in all the documentation. It's like a punishment for going here that I have to pass through <laughs> after coming back to my mother university to just to be able to be, to be reimbursed from my own academic money for this. And two questions, uh, two short questions that I have. Um, we can discuss about the concept of precariat, of working class, but uh, I would say that from my perspective as an activist as well, it is important to, to know how, how do we go about changing the situation, what should be our agenda, if you could briefly expand on that, other than referring us to, to your books, of course, uh, which of course elaborate on the subject. And also, if in this agenda, if you say that there is a fundamental difference between the working class and the precariat, do you see the room for trade unions? Should they organize precarious workers? How should they go about? Maybe you could have some tips for that and tricks. Uh, maybe people around here are from trade union movement. They would like to know this as well, I guess. Thanks a lot. Hello, I am in, uh, a student in the Changing Employment Pro Program. And uh, just I have a question, uh, thank you for, for the presentation and I think it's very interesting. Um, about the, uh, I just lack like, uh, a little bit from uh, the discussion, uh, what is the origin of the problem? Maybe a guy standing could uh, respond to me, because for me it's uh, talking about the, the profit uh, system, the capitalist uh, world in which we are, and uh, especially focusing on, with the precariousness, which is, um, my main uh, uh, preoccupation in my study. Um, but I think it's, it's very important to talk about the system because uh, then we can see the relationship between uh, yeah, the profit system, the, the, the private relate, the property. So the origin of the problem maybe would be the, 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 the essential discussion to, to, to deal with uh, uh, precariousness because it's the future, no? the, precari the precariat is the future of our society, so just uh, talking about the system. Thank you. My name is Barbara Pagan, I work here, um, and I would like to stress the point Professor Hardy said, I would 
rather agree with your uh, view at the world because I am middle aged academic and I feel uh, all the indicator of precarious class I feel my working condition fits that. So I would like to, maybe this is a kind of remark on uh, or also the question maybe the, the source of the situation how we think about the world lies in the working conditions probably like that. But this feature of precariousness is for me at least more important in the sense that this is the model of the world we live in. So this is something like shift in the culture and the type of not only work and working condition, the type of work we are forced to do in a contemporary capitalistic world or, or economy or type of job we do. For instance, such feature like competitiveness or evaluating the, the job just in a narrow type of conditions makes sometimes work uh, and uh, very difficult, right? So, for instance, as academic, I constantly feel I will be, I might be higher any time, or uh, evaluation of my work is related not to the idea of science I imagine I should do. So, maybe we should m talk about this in an even broader sense, that we lived in a culture where, uh, uh, where neoliberal ideas dominated our minds, even those people who should think differently, so we maybe have many examples of people who have some so-called false consciousness. They think it's, it's right to work or live like that. So, and this is one of the problems I would like to pay your attention. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oviedo in Spain and my question is, I see very many very interesting concepts flying around as to what would be the alternative to this precariat work and the increasing precarization of work we're experiencing. And I, I very much like the idea of occupational citizenship in Professor Standing's book, Work After Globalization. But what I wonder is, who would be the agent of change here? Because I share your critique on the ILO, that is an agent of, global, of neoliberal globalization, that it, the goal there is more to regulate labor than to actually empower labor. But who would be the, the agent to empower labor? The 15M movement in Spain has not seized power. The, um, neither has the Occupy Wall Street building seized power. And if you also criticize the state, then, and we see the state as an agent of the capitalist class, then who, where, where is power actually? And where do we as intellectuals need to actually bring these ideas in? You know, where should I go and find a job after my PhD to really change? these issues we're so concerned about. Hello, my name is uh, Patrick Hill from uh, Research Center on Sept Incident in uh, Luxembourg. Um, I would like to thank you very much for these uh, very good contributions, but I think there is, um, we are today also governed by um, a supernatural, um, a, a, a sort of a, a supernatural, um, not supernatural, <laughs> supranational uh, model, which is uh, put forward by the European Union and I, I miss uh, this uh, element a little bit in the discussion because if we look at, um, at work, uh, at employment but also at working conditions we see uh, that there are two, two elements. On one hand uh, um, national states try to pull their um, forces onto the European level and uh, there is some kind of pressure uh, through indicators upon uh, national states uh, to deliver policies and on the one hand there is a very um, soft uh, mode of governance in the European Union impacting on member states and uh, I'm not sure where all this um, fits in, uh, in the discussions and maybe you can, you can do a link uh, with your own research on that. Thank you very much. Um, participation in election has very class, traditional class Form. So, um, it, we, we, we should re, we have it in, in mind, try to explain the, the processes which uh, intuitively are evident for us. But when we um, go deeply into the data, it's not, the picture is not, uh, it's rather complicated. So, thanks very much. I just would like to come back on the colleague who raised the question of 
more general precariousness, because I think this is important again. And I think if we see the precariat as a completely separate class, it takes away uh, the torch from the precariousness that many workers feel. And because all of us, I think most of us work in universities, it is worth using that as an example again. And again, in British universities, which a lot of universities are now um, emulating and copying, then our jobs are governed by a series of metrics and targets. First of all, we have to publish four articles, but not anywhere in particular journals. That's very difficult. Secondly, you have to um, score popularity with the students. And I was told by my head of department at a meeting earlier that we, call, we could all get 100% for enthusiasm. So it's all of these sorts of metrics. And at the beginning of term, we're given in our pigeonholes here to help badges, like very similar to the ones that you get in the supermarkets. So the other end of that is that because I'm a, a union activist, I know for a fact that if people do not meet those metrics, then they're very precarious because they are out of a job. Either they're given more work or they are asked to retire. So I think we have to be really sensitive to the fact that there is not just one group who is precarious, that the marketisation, commodification for university lecturers, teachers, nurses, people that work in government is very, very similar, and I think that's important. Um, somebody asked what an agenda should be, and with my academic hat on, I think there is a conceptual agenda, which is to look at the changing global working class and what that means for work. I think we need to continue debates about class because obviously there are disagreements in this room. And I think there is a need for empirical work. For example, in Poland, I think it's somewhere between 15 or 20% of people are self-employed or more. That's enormous. High, certainly it's the highest in Europe, I know. So, you know, what, what does that actually mean? What are the sectors? What, what does that mean in terms of people's working lives? And what can be, what can be done about it? Um, in Britain, it shows that five, only 5% 5 of people are on zero hours contracts. Now, you know, again, I think it's more than that, but what are those sectors? Um, what is the extent of it? What are the different types of contract? and what can be done about it. So there is you know, a need for research on the ground. Um, secondly, with a, a more um, activist hat on, um, and also an ac academic um, hat, I think that, that you know, we have to look, for example, at issues such as labour mobility and what that means in terms of social dumping. Um, and, for example, I, I'm involved in a, a project for the European Public Service Unions that looks at the mobility specifically of health workers. And you know, the, the, what we're going to start looking at is, for example, the relationship between Spanish nurses in Germany, Polish nurses in the UK. And again, you know, what, what does that mean in terms of integrating those workers and making sure that they are not precarious, that they have proper contracts, they have proper wages and proper working conditions. So I think there's a need not just for analysis, but for looking very specifically in time and in space and in sectors at what can actually be done to reduce precarity. And I think those are the intellectual and practical agendas that we need to follow. Yes, um, I'm, I'm at, you probably appreciate that I'm almost wishing I, instead of talking about tertiary time and the history of time, I talked about my book. <laughs> but you would imagine by all the commentaries that uh, I'd been talking about my book. 
And had I presented my book, I would have been able to preempt your interesting question. Don't make a reference to your book. But I would take up a whole no another session talking about it. So I'm now confronted with a lot of, uh, a lot of points, many of which are very interesting. But I, ref I think the general tone of them highlights the fact that we are in an interregnum. We are in a period where we're struggling to come to terms with new phenomena. I mean, I thought Paul Stewart's uh, question, I, it will point, qu uh, comment, um, reminded me, of course, that we've never had any homogeneous class, we know that. Uh, but the, the most important thing about the precariat, as I said, said earlier, is that it is defined not in terms of insecure labour contracts. I say that a thousand times. You don't define the precariat by whether or not they have insecure labour contracts. Now, do I shout it? To get that point across? Do I shout it? Because I keep saying it, that the precariat is not defined solely by the labour relations. It is defined by the fact that it has no occupational security, has no occupational narrative control of being in control of time, being in control of space, and in effect it is commodified in a sense that is very powerfully uh, uh, radical and I'll come back to that at the moment. I think we've got to the stage of global capitalism which is fundamentally different from a hundred years ago. We are in the age of rentier capitalism, where an increasing proportion of total national income around the world, global income, is going in rental forms, not in traditional forms of profit. That creates a complete thing, but we can talk about the breakdown of the income distribution system so that the old laborist agenda of trying wage bargaining as a way of getting a rising share of total income is, is doomed, is doomed. We have seen stagnant and falling wages in the rich industrialized countries for the last 30 years. And if we want to redistribute and change the income distribution pattern of growing inequalities, <laughs> then we have to have an alternative strategy. Now I think with the interesting comments by our French uh, participant, she is a much better expert than I am, but I feel that in the French language there is actually a distinction between travail, which is labor and has etymological roots <coughs> of pain and onerous treatment of, uh, of torture. I mean, that, that's the etymological root. And activité the actions of participating in a broader sense. I'm relieved to see you <laughs> nodding. But what I was trying to do was say that we must go back to the richer conceptualization of any dualism. Because we've also got to re rescue leisure as, as, as more than just free time and spending it. So I, I, I appreciated the point. But one of the defining characteristics of the precariat compared with the old proletariat is it's exploited as much off the workplace and off working time as much as in the workplace and in labor time. That is different from the old uh, proletariat. Now, one of the interesting things, and I, as I wasn't talking about my book, I was talking about our conceptualization of time. I didn't make it, but I'm happy to make it is that if I address groups of the precariat, people who define themselves as part of the precariat, as an emerging class, whether it's in Spain or Italy or in Tokyo, one of the fascinating things is the, the, the modal type, the educated, do not suffer from a false labor consciousness, an a, a sense that they feel that they get their happiness and satisfaction <coughs> in their jobs. They will treat labor as instrumental. I, I need to do a job because I need income. But actually, I'm wanting to create a different way of looking 
at living and occupying the public space. That's why Getchi Park was such a powerful statement by the precariat. That is why when Podemos in Spain is a precariat party and its agenda is emancipatory and egalitarian. But it's looking at the idea of the precariat and precariatization, not just as a matter of insecurity. It's, a, it's, it's also looking at it at the fact that people in the precariat feel they are supplicants. Supplicants. They don't have rights. They have to ask. They have to beg. <coughs> they have to satisfy some bureaucrat or some parent or some father or husband. They have to, they're always at that point of being a supplicant because they do not have an anchor of belonging to communities of rights and citizenship. And I think by looking at the precariat as a separate class in the making, as I call it, and seeing it as different from the process of precariatization, and I agree with the, the sentiment of your comment that a lot of us are experiencing the pressures of precariatization. But that is different from being in the precariat itself because you have a combination of things. If you're in the salariat, you've still got the means of controlling your time. You've still got the means of having access to quality public space and private space. You have the means of getting financial knowledge. You have the means of getting access to capital. If you're in the precariat, you don't. So there are different material and conscious interests at stake. Now, I can't answer all the points made, and if I don't answer your particular point, I apologize in advance. It doesn't mean that I don't regard it as important. But I'm just going to mention just a, 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 a few things. The uh, person who mentioned the, the uh, Swiss referendum, it was not a referendum on basic income. It was on a, a referendum about raising the minimum wage to a particular level. So people who go around saying it was a defeat for basic income are talking what we call in English nonsense. It was a referendum on minimum wage. As it happens, there is now, the, the government has had to accede and agree that in 2016, there will be a national referendum on a basic income. That is, uh, income given to every citizen as a right, unconditional on behavioral terms and equal for everybody. Last year, we had a, a, a European uh, campaign to get signatures, and in 27 European countries we got about 400,000 signatures, and there are plans of the basic income networks around Europe to organize a campaign next year, because if we can get one million signatures, then the European Commission has to do feasibility studies about whether it could be done. And all I can say is, I invite all of you to join Bien and our, our aspiring Polish network, which is discussing the possibilities of moving towards a basic income, discussing the potential advantages and the disadvantages of doing so. And I think we're at that stage of the debate. It's very interesting. We're now suddenly finding, we've just done some pilots that, that I talked about yesterday, which is altering the way we think about giving basic security. Shouldn't we all be wanting basic security for every Polish person? Is that what we want? Yes, I hope so. And I was talking to trade union leaders, and I said, why is it that trade union leaders over the years have been the most hostile to a basic income? The most. And the leaders, a very old leader who was chairing it, at that stage when I said that remark, he said, oh, I think we'll have a coffee break now. We'll go for coffee. And then in the next session he came back, I think we'll move to another subject. <laughs> but an Italian trade union leader stood up, a young man, and he said, I've been thinking what Guy said before the coffee break. 
And I think the reason we Labour unions have been opposed to a basic income is it would mean that people wouldn't want to join unions. And I said, if you think about that comment for one second, you will think how terrible it is, but it's also wrong. It's wrong. People who have basic security are more likely to participate in society, are more likely to join associations advancing emancipatory causes and advancing towards equality. And the young trade unionists, particularly women trade unionists, are much more open to a basic income. In various countries, that is, that is happening. Now, why is the precariat a dangerous class? The concept of a dangerous class, those of you who are historical-minded, had two roots. It had one, the Marx, Marx's root, referred to the people in Paris who were likely to be criminals and so on. But there's another historical root, which is that the dangerous class consisted of the self-employed, the traders, the craftsmen, who were craft ethic driven, who were resisting proletarianization and stood against being part of the proletariat and stood against capital. They were dangerous because they rejected both agendas. Now, when the first Labour MPs in Britain were elected in 1906, they were asked by a journalist who had been, which book had most inspired them. They didn't say Marx. They said a book by John Ruskin, Unto the Last, which was about craftsmanship, resisting being put in labor and proletarianization. Of course, subsequently, that ethic was pushed aside by laborism in the 20th century. But today's dangerous class is rejecting the old political agendas of the Social Democrats. Why are they losing everywhere when we're in the middle of a crisis period? Because they're offering an agenda that is a dystopia of more consumption, more wages, but they're not offering a future. They're not offering a future of a good society. That is, so they're rejecting that. They reject neoliberalism, but they're dangerous because they are rejecting the political center. Some parts of the precariat, the uneducated, are listening to populist neo-fascists who are saying, your insecurity, your lack of future is due to the migrants, the Roma, the Poles, or whatever group and therefore we're going to get rid of them. That agenda is attracting more and more. We know. We know. I mentioned in my speech. But the other part of the precariat is actually looking for a better good society, one where work <coughs> and leisure and the commons and control over time are the, are the real uh, agendas. Now, a few more points. I've emphasized that I think the mistake of laborism in the 20th century was to go for labor decommodification and not labor power decommodification. By which I mean is that shifting away to, from money wages to various forms of benefits and non-wage payments and trying to improve the social income that way was actually not decommodifying people because you only got those things if you continue to be in stable full-time labor, paying contributions or having an employer paying contributions. The mistake was to go for that rather than a strategy for decommodifying ourselves, decommodifying ourselves, and enabling us to stand against the labor market, stand against that sort of thing. And I think that we now have got an opportunity to reinvent uh, that agenda. The last question I will mention, and then I will sit down and look forward to that coffee break. The last, the last thing is the question about supernational. It was your question, was it? I think the supernational. I think, uh, and again, I'm going to offend this gentleman by saying, if you look at the last chapter or penultimate chapter of my book, Work After Globalization, I, I consider that. 
I think actually outside the European Union machinery, you've got a, a, a supranational uh, infrastructure. And I happen to live outside Geneva. And in the 1990s, the global capitalism changes were reflected in the fact that the building and all the, uh, all the power was going to the World Trade Organization that was liberalizing <coughs> and opening up the global market system. If you go to Geneva today, the building that's growing and is making all the others look drab and old is WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, and then reflects the changing character of global capitalism, going towards a rentier model where the plutocrats and the plutocratic corporations are gaining their vast incomes through these various forms of rent, patents, royalties, subsidies from governments, uh, 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 copyright, and all of these things, which is a fundamental part of global capitalism that didn't used to exist. We've got a plutocratic thing, so the richest 85 people in the world, 85, just about our number, have more income than the bottom 40% of the whole world. This is a fundamentally different model, and most of that income comes from rent. So we have to have a different strategy from bargaining to get more of the share between profit and, and, and labor. We have, to, we have to go for a different strategy for redistribution. But that's another agenda. I think the supranational uh, ruling institutions, which are neoliberal in character, WIPO, WTO, IMF, World Bank, and the international credit agencies, which are linked to US capital, these are the, the, the demons <coughs> that we've got to confront. But thank you very much for the questions. As I say, I apologize for not responding to all, and I'll come back to the, the, the uh, linguistics expert and say that I do address the charter, the whole strategy in the new book, and whereas the Magna Carta had 63 articles, and many of them are still relevant today and for the precariat debate, including things like due process, my charter has only got 29 articles, but they're quite big policy proposals. But they were different from what a, a proletariat charter would have looked like 100 years ago. Thank you very much for the time. Firstly, I agree entirely that uh, the current uh, example of institutional form of, uh, of the precariat, uh, I think it's, it's Podemos now. And, uh, last week, uh, for the first time, uh, it was uh, the first uh, in the intention to vote survey. So the possibility of uh, putting uh, bipartismo to an end is a real possibility in Spain. Uh, that's uh, one example. There are other examples in Spain, like uh, like Guanyin, uh, the, the movement uh, rather local from Catalonia, but it spreads uh, to, to, to many other uh, cities. And Spain is also a great example that uh, you can be a labor union and you, you can be for basic income. Uh, uh, a part of uh, Basque labor unions, also a communist labor union, uh, they are definitely in favor of uh, unconditional basic income. Uh, Looking outside Spain, I think that I'm also looking forward to, to what uh, series I would, uh, could, could do. Uh, and to, to respond to the question of uh, Professor Zekdikar, uh, precariat can be dangerous for whom? Uh, in Spain, it's, it could be dangerous for capitalists. In Poland, it could be dangerous for itself. Uh, when it's, uh, in fact, played, uh, the, the groups of the precariat are played against each other. That's the, the, the worst situation. Uh, and in Greece, I think that it can be uh, both of, uh, of, of, this, of these possibilities. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It was absolutely impressive, very interesting. I, uh, I've never, uh, I, as, far as, I, as far as I remember, it's uh, one of the most interesting debates uh, I participated in. Thank you for all. Uh, <laughs>